Thanks again, everybody, for joining Develop Productivity Engineering Lowdown. Uh, this is a webcast series we started a few years ago. Um, uh, I'm Ruse from Great Old Team, and we have uh, Nelson and Tyler here from the Great Old Engineering Team working on the Develocity product that's uh, formerly known as Great Old Enterprise. And uh, Martin Bonin, he's our special guest. He joins us from Apollo, the company behind that very popular GraphQL product. And he's on the Kotlin team there. And uh, this, this webcast started just about sharing productivity engineering wins, best practices, and success stories from the industry with the community. And we, do, we try to do this once every couple of months. Uh, and it's very well produced by our uh, production streaming team. And uh, so welcome. Thanks for joining us. Let's jump in into the agenda. We're going to talk about uh, what is GraphQL, what is uh, the Apollo Kotlin project. We're going to talk about their the velocity and developer productivity wins. And um, that's basically what's going to go on in the show. I always like to kick things off with a story. I personally have met Martin a few times at uh, Android-related events. So we both have been working in the Android industry for, for a while now. And so I've, we ran into each other many times. I think uh, DroidCon London, I think it was the last time. Uh, and maybe we ran into to each other. What, Martin, why don't you tell the story of how this project where you worked with uh, the Great Enterprise, the Velocity team, how it all came about? Why don't you tell us the story behind there? Actually, uh, it's a funny story. It all started uh, from uh, Nicola Corti. Nico Corti, if you're in the audience, hi, Nico. Uh, who's also um, an open source maintainer and uh, he's working on uh, Detect. Uh, <laughs> linter like a uh, tool for for kotlin and uh, one day we were talking gradle stuff and build times and stuff like this and he told me hey you know what uh, uh, we now use this uh, gradle pricing and it's it's really great and uh, i think it was just before and during uh, droidcon london or something like this so i said hey this is a pretty good idea so i just stopped by the the, the gradle booth there and uh, asked about it and this is how it started uh, amazing it, it took uh, yeah it took a few weeks months to 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 set it up but uh, this is how it, it all started and I, i'm really glad we we did this that amazing and, and and what martin's referring to uh we give a uh, great enterprise dev velocity uh to open source projects uh and there's many of them available you can search for them and uh, we recently did a project with the apache software foundation putting a lot of those open source projects being powered by the velocity and that's what brought us here today uh, uh you know i had a chat with martin with, with with nelson and and tyler about all the interesting stuff they they did and found and wanted to share that with you well i wanted to do a quick intro martin about you know, your company and what you all work for. And there's a lot of folks are, you know, uh, GraphQL, very exciting product. Uh, maybe start it there. Tell us a little bit, give us a brief intro about, you know, GraphQL. Yeah, sure. So GraphQL, I've been doing GraphQL for three years now, uh, something like this. I actually did GraphQL before at my previous company. Uh, GraphQL means graph query language. So it's a uh, language uh, to build your APIs and to query data in your backend. And um, if you're new to GraphQL, maybe the easiest way to do it, and I prepared some slides, is to, um, is to compare it to the usual stuff, which is how you typically do APIs. If you already talked to a backend, uh, so you are probably familiar with HTTP REST. This is what I've like powered the internet for the last decade, I mean, pretty much forever. You have an endpoint, you have a new URL uh, to get a user. In this example, it's a user 42, something like this. You do a get on this URL using HTTP 1.1 and you get a response. Usually it's a JSON with a lot of fields, um, maybe too much, maybe too little, uh, maybe strings, integer floats, uh, a lot of different things. The thing is, maybe you're not interested into everything. Uh, maybe you love Antoine Dupont, but you don't want his email, or maybe you're not interested in all the games he played. 
So this is where GraphQL comes in is instead of having different URLs and returning different set of data, which you don't really know what is inside. GraphQL works the other way around. So it's more of a discussion between a client and a server. So in GraphQL, you would typically do this. Uh, you write something that resembles JSON. It's not exactly JSON because it's GraphQL, but if you just want the first name, you just ask for the first name and you get back the first name. If you also want the last name, oops, that was a bit fast. You can ask the last name if you want all the games. Well, you got me, you just ask the backend what you want. And the nice thing with this is you don't have to remember a lot of different URLs. You don't have to guess what the data is going to be returned like. So you know in advance what the data is going to be returned. And also it's a lot more efficient on the network because you don't transmit useless data. And we call this no overfetching in GraphQL. Like if you talk to someone about GraphQL, they are going to tell you GraphQL removes overfetching, which is a nice property. Um, so yeah, another, another one cool stuff about GraphQL is that it's 100% type safe, which we love uh, when we're doing Kotlin. So it has support for nullability and uh, and so on, which is all kind of stuff we support in Apollo Kotlin. But I feel like maybe I should pause here and see if there are any questions about GraphQL at this point. Tyler, we're going to take most questions at the Q&A, but if you have an interesting one over there, we can uh, take it. Oh, yeah, not seeing anything so far, so... Yeah, what, I, what I forgot to mention is that uh, GraphQL is open source, like it's 100% open source as well. Uh, it was started from Facebook in 2015, if I remember correctly, like to solve this problem of having too many APIs, like too many different endpoints, and has been all open source ever since. And tell us a, a bit about what you, and so how does what you do in your project, your uh Apollo Kotlin project, how does that fit into all of this? Excellent question, and I have a slide for this. <laughs> uh, so the nice thing with GraphQL is that um, it, uh, it, it works very nicely with microservices. So if you have a big monolith like uh, we had in our previous company, uh, you can break down this monolith in a lot of different what we call subgraph. So you can break down your monolith in microservices, and maybe you keep a small or a big chunk of your monolith, you can keep it. And each of these different microservices can have their own schema, their own types, which they are responsible for. And then you can assemble those, or you can federate those, and using the Apollo router, you can expose a nice clean API uh, to all your clients, and you don't have to deal with plenty of URLs and different types and whatnot. So this is what you are a bit too fast. This is what we do at Apollo. So Apollo really has two parts. There's one commercial part and one open source part, which I'm working on. Commercial part is about all the tools you need to scale your API. So we offer hosting for your router. We offer like a lot of observability or telemetry tools. Like if you want to know exactly what's happening in your API, like uh, you want to make sure nothing ever breaks when you make changes, or you want to know what are the slow paths so that you can identify them and go back to the client that is responsible for it and, and discuss it. So it's all this stuff. And the part I am working on is, uh, if I can enable the laser here, it's this one here, like small one. <laughs> so um, it looks small on this uh, diagram, but it's actually uh, not so small. Like before joining Apollo, I was like, okay, I will GraphQL client, what, what can it be? Like, it's not that, that huge, but turns out there's a lot of different components. Uh, we have uh, caching, we, we have a lot of runtime stuff. We have caching, um, we have um, persisted queries. Well, a lot of stuff that happens at, at runtime, but there is also a lot of tooling. Like we have an IntelliJ plugin so that you can have autocomplete in your IDE when you type GraphQL. And we obviously have a Gradle plugin that takes your GraphQL, takes your schema, and generate Kotlin. So this is really the core of Apollo Kotlin, uh, what I do uh, with my colleague Benoit in Lyon. Hello, Benoit, if you're watching, is we're writing this, uh, this compiler that takes your GraphQL and translates that to Kotlin. I don't know if that answers the question. Yeah, absolutely. And 
when when you came to that great old booth to chat with our folks, Dennis, and eventually meeting Nelson and whatnot, what, what, what did you want to accomplish? What were your, some of your developer productivity engineering challenges, pain points, and whatnot that, uh, hey, we have to address these? And kind of what led you to us? Yeah, so I, I said there are a lot of components, and the, really the common stuff between all the components is Gardle. Like we have a build with, uh, I was I should have checked this, but something around 30 to 40 modules. Um, it's a composite build. So uh, the main one uh, that publishes all the libraries has maybe 15 different modules for all the different uh, caches, all the different runtimes, and so on. And then we also have a composite build that uh, includes the first one and has something like, it, it's always growing, but maybe something like 30 or 40 different Gradle modules today for integration tests. So because we have a Gradle plugin, we cannot just do everything in one build. We have a main build that produces the Gradle plugin and all the libraries, and then we include that one to run all the integration tests. And so the build became quite complicated. Like, And uh, not only that, but we also are very proud to support Kotlin multi-platform. So you can run Apollo Kotlin on Android, obviously, but also on iOS, on Linux, or macOS if you want. And so if you count the number of tasks that a typical build is running, it's uh, in the thousands, maybe more. And mm -hmm. each time you do a change, you don't like to wait. Like we have GitHub, we have pull requests, we have stuff like this. So waiting 40 minutes every time you want to merge, uh, a pull request is not super fun. So I think this was the main drive behind stopping by, by your booth. Besides, I mean, besides the fact that we have a lot of Gradle code to code in the repo and feels good to learn more about it. Yeah, great. And, and, and Nelson, uh, I think initially it was like a dentist or someone, when, when you became aware of this project, then you had your first meeting with Martin you know, what, what, what were you thinking? You know, it was like, hey, what are the first few things that we need to do? Yeah, no, that's a good question. The first thing is always to analyze the build, to take a look at the build using a build scan, uh, understand what's happening in the build, where's the time going, uh, whether it's the configuration phase, um, the execution phase, dependency downloading time, all these types of things. Take a look at it together and then decide uh, the path forward. And when we first did do this, so, so we, we set up a great enterprise Develocity server. I'm going to be mixing those names up for, for a while, so so bear with me. Uh, but what, so when we first set that up and you all had your kind of first meeting, well, what what did you? I, I know Nelson, it was a while ago, but what are some of the yeah. things that you that you noticed? That okay, hey, we should start here because as a some work when you're working on developer productivity, you have a lot of things you can do. You know, we talk about this all the time when I chat with developer productivity developer experiences teams. They have maybe 20, 30, 40 things that they have to do within a quarter. Uh and so you need some data, whatnot to prioritize that. And and that's one of the value propositions of the Develocity product. So what what were the things that you noticed right off the bat? Yeah, and maybe to add to your previous question, one of the first things we also do is to capture a baseline to understand how often local developers are taking to build, how often it's taking on CI to build and capturing all those builds. And then once we did that, the next thing we did was we ran uh, some experiments via what we call the build validation scripts. And those help you understand what sorts of build caching issues are present in your build and by running those, we also uncovered a few other issues. And I think there's a slide on on all these things that that we uncovered, um, because of course, yeah, I can't remember um, so far back in in my memory. But um, oh, here it is. Yeah, there's a slide. Yeah, and and um, yeah, we found a a bunch of issues in um, the the Apollo build itself, for example, built by attribute in the manifest file, which was causing cache misses because it was different from one build to the next. And yeah, there's a huge list of issues there that we found, not just in um, in the uh, Apollo 
great old build, but that plugins that they included in their build, such as Doka, Doka 2, Kotlin plugin itself, um, the Gradle IntelliJ plugin, uh, which which Apollo uses. It was actually, we, we found so many things and found so many bugs against all these different tools. It was, it was, yeah, it was really, um, yeah, it was really powerful um, to, to, yeah, go through their build, fix all the caching issues with the up-to-date checks with the local build cache and with the remote build cache using the build validation scripts. Thanks for that summary, Nelson. And, and Martin, for you, what was what were the more what were some of the highlights, the the very impactful highlights uh, of this process and and the productivity uh, gains? I'm going to cite two. Uh, the first one is a remote build cache, which uh, is a massive speed up. So that's a huge win. And the second one is actual collaboration, like because we do open source. There are a lot of uh, different repos, and uh, Nelson mentioned a few. There's a lot of different issues, different teams, different people working at different times in different parts of the world. And communication is sometimes not easy. And being able to share a link that contains all the information for someone else to do the digging is actually maybe uh, one of the biggest highlights of this whole process. Like, of course, we have all the performance improvement and it's really nice. Like, it's super cool we have this. But also being able to work frictionless with other team, I think is a second. Like, it's almost as important as the, the performance improvement we get locally in the repo because it's impacting several people and uh, it's a lot of uh, it removes a lot of the friction like and uh, and for this the tool is really nice because you everything is shareable with a link like if you have your your build uh, with all your logs you can link to a precise log uh, in your build output which is quite easy if you have a specific task you want to link to you can also do this um I can show that later. I have some screenshot about uh, task comparisons, but uh, this was also super useful. So yeah, performance and uh, easier collaboration as really the two, two highlights of this process for me. It, and you did write a nice blog post about this that we'll share with everyone that goes into a lot of those details. Um, the, I, I want to hear about some of those ways because I saw it in the slide. It, CI build times went down from 28 minutes to four minutes. Was that like the average or the like the P95? What, what would that? That's a that's a big uh, that's a huge win. Yeah. So this was the time uh, when we wrote the article, so uh, one or two months back, and I think this was a median time over all the CI builds uh, over a range of two weeks, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Wow. Obviously, like uh, the, 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 um, the reality is always complex. And I, I saw there was a question from Simon in the chat asking if there is a correlation between longer build times and number of full builds. And this time fluctuates uh, depending the area of Apollo Kotlin we are working on. Uh, like, as I said before, we have a lot a very deep stack. And if we're changing something very low inside Apollo API, which is the low level uh, module, like every module in Apollo Kotlin depends on Apollo API. So if you change something there, you almost get no benefit from the build cache because something has changed. And so you cannot reuse the previous outputs. So you have to recompute everything. And so if your build takes 40 minutes and you change something at the very low level, then your build cache is not going to magically make everything, like compute everything for you. Uh, so depending the areas we're working on, like the gains are, can fluctuate uh, during the time. But overall, I mean, the, the win is constant, like compared to what we had previously. Sometimes the CI passes in a few minutes, which is a massive win when we had to, to wait 40 or more minutes. Got it. Uh, Tyler, uh, any other interesting questions in there? Uh, so where would someone be able to find uh, the build validation scripts turning against our own Gradle build? 
are they bundled with the Gradle wrapper as utilities or are they elsewhere? Well, we got an advanced good. question. We haven't even gotten into the build validation script section yet. Um, Nelson, you want to take that? Yeah, I, I was going to say, yeah, well, maybe we'll cover it in the next slide. So it's it's a really good question, but it's open source. It's available on GitHub. Um, we'll post a link in the Q&A chat. Maybe, Tyler, you can do that. Um, and yeah, it's open source. So you're free to run it against any builds you have. You do need to have a Develocity instance to point the scripts to. Um, so that's that's the only caveat. But yeah, maybe that's a good segue into our next yeah. uh, slide. Be, be, let's take another one, and then we'll put that question on ice. Tyler, you yeah. got another one in there? Sure. Uh, yeah, out of curiosity, did you analyze the correlation between longer build times and number of full builds, including integration I, tests? I think Martin, Martin. already kind of answered that. Okay. We got another um, one? Let's see. Have we seen a change in developer iteration speed, number of commits, or builds per week? Great question. Uh, awesome question, and we haven't measured that, actually. We, we should. Um, I, maybe I should give a bit more context about the team. Uh, we are a team of working full-time on Apollo Kotlin, so it's not like we, uh, we have, like, thousands of commits every day. Like we are, we are doing our best to do a lot of commits, but we, we, we are not a huge team. Uh, we do have like um, people working from the communities also, pull requests coming from different parts of the world and also working with different people in, in different projects. So this is where a lot of that wins is important is these people don't have to wait. I think it's it's more a quality of life uh, insurance for me about um, the, the fact that you can safely uh, do a change and get feedback about your change in a few minutes. Like it also keeps you focused. Uh, you're not going to Twitter or whatnot to do something else, be waiting for your CI. You can iterate a lot faster, but we, we haven't measured it uh, in terms of raw number and we should definitely do that. Yeah, and, and that's a, you know the million dollar question that many folks ask us all the time where we uh, work on the velocity with is when builds get faster, do folks run more builds? There's a lot of significant data out there around this that folks run um, more builds, many blog posts and whatnot. Google did a bunch of projects on this. I don't have those references in hand <laughs> right now to, to share. Um, but we, we are seeing a lot of that in the industry across many uh, organizations and whatnot. Um, Nelson, you've seen the same. I mean, you worked on at SoundCloud, you worked uh, on Great Enterprise and Develocity. And you help a lot of customers adopt it as well. What do you see? Yeah, no, it's absolutely true. Actually, there used to be this um, this quote from, from Uber and their um, developer productivity engineer who said, Engineers used to run a build and then run around and get a coffee before they they finish their build. And, you know, you go get a coffee, you get distracted. Even when you're running local builds uh, and they're not, you know, 20 minutes long, if, if they're even one to two minutes, you're going to get distracted. You do something else and then you're going to end up running less builds simply because of that. So, yeah, the faster you build, the more focused you can stay and the more builds you're going to run. And many developer productivity teams or developer experience teams are doing that today. LinkedIn folks have this metric called uh, commit to publish uh, that they measure regularly. Uh, how um, other organizations measure what one thing I see saw recently is a uh, release velocity. How many uh, uh, how many PRs can we release within a within a, a, a time? Can a developer release, merge, and deploy within a single time period? And they measure that, and then they look at reduction of build times and PR build times and whatnot, and how that impacts those. And um, yeah, um, we'll take some more questions uh, later. There was one other thing in here that seemed interesting. I don't know if this was from Nelson or Tyler. You, uh, while looking at the insights from Develocity, uh, use this slowest test. Develocity has this test dashboard where you can analyze your slowest tests. Uh, you found some really long tests, one around seven minutes. What was that all about? 
Yeah, that's a good one. I I don't know if maybe we'll do like a a demo later of of that, but um in that velocity in the UI, you can sort all your tests by the slowest tests. And that's often one way of speeding up your builds. What we've seen with a lot of customers is sometimes one of their tests is like three times longer than all the other ones. And your build is only going to be as fast as your slowest test. So just breaking apart that test um, allows better partitioning if you're splitting up your tests, things like that. Um, and yeah, and we found um, a, a seven minute long test, I remember. Martin, did you want to say something on that? Yeah, I think this one is um, the Gradle integration tests. Uh, we run Gradle, several versions of Gradle for the Gradle plugin. So um, it, it was long before because, well, first of all, there are a lot of tests. And also each one downloading different version of Gradle and each version of Gradle downloading the dependencies. Like we had this thing where uh, we wanted to share the home screen, uh, the, the home screen, sorry, the home, uh, home pass, like the home directory between the different Gradle invocations so that we could share the dependencies. But a lot of these seven minutes are actually dependency downloading. And we, we, we got a bit better by, by splitting them. So we have, so they can now execute in parallel, but uh, we still need to dig into that uh, sharing dependency stuff. Yeah, and I remember more... we were oh, sorry, experimenting sorry. With, with a couple, being able, one, to analyze that it was the dependency downloading was a really interesting insight from the build scan. I remember we had a couple of ideas on how to optimize sharing the dependency cache, things like that. Can't remember what the outcome was. It was several months ago. So we did it and uh, rolled it back because we had another issue uh, with, uh, I think it was about locking between uh, the different caches, uh, like uh, because they were downloading dependencies to the same cache, they were writing at the same time, and uh, we ended up having a, a deadlock here or something like this. Uh, so the, the, the conclusion was we should make one read only and, uh, and this is still what we need to do. Yeah. And I just want to add that this is the, the dependency cache and our doc state that you should share this in a read only state. We're not yeah. talking about the build cache, which is a shareable cache. You can have multiple builds read and write to the route build cache at the same time. And that works great. <laughs> no, thank, thanks for explaining that. Uh, you know, folks new to Gradle, something that we have five different type of caches. Um, we're not going to go into that's for a different webcast. Uh, before <laughs> we move on to, you know, how we, the experiments that that we, uh, well, Martin ran to, to find some of these things slowing the build time down. I have one more thing from my notes that I was looking back at, Martin. You mentioned you're, you all are using Kotlin multi-platform and you mentioned some pains around linking times that uh, uh, the remote build cache help with. And a lot of folks are using Kotlin multi-platform these days. Uh, uh, Jake Wharton did a nice talk at DP Summit on what he does to release faster with that. Uh, anything you, what do you, tell us a little bit more about that and share with the community because more folks are picking up Kotlin multi-platform these days. Oh yeah, 100%. I, I love Kotlin. Really, this is my language of choice. Like it's, it's a great language. There is just this one thing about linking times for multi-platform. It's so slow. Like even the most basic uh, application takes I want to say something like one minute to link. It's it's very long. And and when you have several architecture or several targets, you're building for macOS, iOS, and maybe watchOS, and maybe Linux, Windows, you multiply everything. So you end up with a lot of minutes spent in your build, uh, building basically the same thing all over again. So being able to just download the output of the linking phase from the remote build cache was a time saver, like a huge lifesaver. Uh, saved us a lot of time. So obviously when you change some stuff, you still have to relink and recompile, but still uh, we get to avoid that most of the time now. 
and, and sorry for putting you on the spot, but off top, how much time was the saving out of the you know one to two minutes per per link? I I will, I'd have to do the math, but uh, we have six or seven targets. Um, so the linking is for the test binaries. Uh, we have I don't know I, how many how many modules did I say? Let's say everyone has one test binary, so twenty modules, seven targets. What I need to do some math. One forty minutes. Am I correct here? I, I don't know. Too early morning. <laughs> yeah, for, for yeah, yeah. Need, need more coffee. I think I, I, I think it's uh, yeah, it's something like uh, yeah, a lot of time. <laughs> uh, moving on to the next topic, uh, and there was a question related to that. So, how do you find all the stuff that's slowing it down? Um, it's one of these great. Uh, features or solutions that Nelson's team has developed called build validation scripts. So for example, your incremental build, if you want to know what's slowing it down in the past, you run a, run a build, uh, run a clean build to see the incremental build cache. Those are the up-to-date things you see when you run your Gradle build and uh, not make any changes, run it again with all of the cash turned off and then compare these two. So you'd have to do all this stuff manually. And Nelson's team has developed these build validation scripts that Martin and team ran. And, uh, and Nelson, you, you want to talk about that a bit uh, and kind of go back into that, that question that we had initially? I think we have it still in the chat somewhere to kind of tie those two together. Yeah, um, let's let's show the next slide for that question. When you run the build validation scripts, as Ruse said, it automatically runs your build twice without any changes to make sure that everything is up to date, everything is cacheable, everything is cache relocatable, and it gives you this nice output that helps you easily um, understand, analyze, and fix any sort of caching or up-to-date issues that you see in your build. And the output of this execution uh, of this script was uh, experiment three, which focuses on build caching from different locations. That is your cache relocatability, uh, which is important when you're using the remote cache and sharing cache artifacts amongst your team. You need the cache entries, uh, that is the cache key actually, to be relocatable. Um, so yeah, in this output, it says warning not all cacheable task outputs were taken from the build cache in the second build this reduces the savings in the task execution time i'm just reading what's on screen but um yeah then you can click the links for example there's a link that just shows you the executed cacheable tasks an executed cacheable task is not what you uh, yeah it's it's what you can improve on right it, the task is cacheable but it didn't come from the cache. Uh, and then you can also go to the task inputs comparison, which is a really powerful feature of Develocity. You can see exactly which inputs are different to the task. And, and I think we have some examples of that in, in further slides um, of how exactly that looks. It, and uh, everybody at, Martin, everybody at Gradle knows that this is, I love talking about build validation script. They're sick and tired of me talking about this stuff. Um, I, I just love it because it just fits into the developer productivity engineering thing so well, especially if you have many projects. Um, and in, in short, to salesify what some of Nelson's saying, why, we, why I love talking about this, and I'm trying to get as many people to use this as possible, uh, and for my buddy Emmanuel at Netflix on the Netflix mobile team, they run this thing every day to make nice. sure something doesn't happen that's slowing down the build. And it, it gives you some really interesting, what I love about it is, hey, here's my build time. Here's how much the build cache is saving me right out of the box if I don't have to do anything. And it gives me the observability to say, hey, you had a cache miss, you had one of them, and how much time did it cost? So if it's one cache, one task at a cache miss and it's 0.01 second, well, you don't care, you move on. 
because Martin's job is not spending on build times 24 seven. So you just move on to something else. So it gives you that observability, hey, something went wrong, but then it gives you the data to prioritize. Okay, this is five minutes, uh, you know, you, you, because of a timestamp or whatnot. And, and then the quick links with the UI to fix it. And it's such a unique solution, those quick investigation links to, hey, here's what caused the cache miss, Here's the file that it lives in. It's super cool. Uh, was it easy to use for you, Martin? When it, you know how easy was that for you to get set up? It was quite good to be honest. Uh, quite smooth. And what I loved about it is that it gives a framework to work with. Like when you start digging into these complicated issues with up to dateness and local cache and remote build cache and all the different caches. It's easy to get lost, but because the scripts are organized and they come in a sequential way, uh, you, you get a few steps you can follow and fix things, uh, one thing after the other. So it was very reassuring working through the whole process and being able to see the progress at every step. Uh, so this is what I like the, the most. And obviously the fact that you get all the links uh, in the Develocity UI directly inside your terminal is also pretty sweet. And Nelson, you were showing a slide for that before I interrupted your uh, flow with how much I love build validation scripts. <laughs> uh, I know I you're sick and tired of, of hearing me say that. Uh, I like to promote cool things. And if something is cool, I like to share with the world. Uh, yeah. Show that slide of the quick fix with the UI. Um, yeah, here, I'll go I'll go through these slides. So, so this slide here, it shows um, that these are all the cacheable tasks that were executed that came from, uh, that didn't come from the cache, that is. And here they're sorted by duration. So you can easily see, just like you were saying earlier, I want to focus my time on that task that took four minutes, the Apollo Gradle plugin colon test. This was actually the lo super long test we were talking about earlier. Um, and and yeah, so that would be the, the, yeah, the first thing I would do to make this build faster is focus on making that task cacheable. And then in the next slide, um, we can we can see here, okay, what are the things that are making this task not cache relocatable? And you can see it very easily that there is file property inputs to the test task that contain absolute paths. And these absolute paths mean if I'm building it on my machine and then Martin builds it on his machine, he's not going to be able to reuse that cached artifact. Um, and Gradle Enterprise lets you really easily identify which task it is, which input property is because you can have hundreds of tasks, hundreds of input properties. You don't have to go dig through the console log to figure out with the uh, cache debug mode and copy paste the cache keys. You can just see it very visually, right? The green and blue dots in the, the velocity UI mean that there's a difference there. And with the build validation scripts, it saves the output of each execution, which makes it very easy to go back into that folder where it was executed from and look at the contents of whether it's a property or a file, whatever it is that's different and, and compare it. Um, yeah. And then going on to the next, uh, slide there's, um, uh, here we have, yeah, one of the fixes that Martin did. Yeah. Maybe Martin, do you want to talk about this one? Yeah. So absolute pass, uh, came from the fact that if you define um, an input programmatically, so not using any of the nice annotations, by default, I think the pass sensitivity is absolute. So you have to specify it explicitly to be relative, which we, we didn't do. And the fix, this one was actually one of the, the easy ones, uh, easy win. And it allowed to cache this seven minute long test that we were talking about earlier. So it was never cached before. So it means every time we run CI, even if we just change something in uh, documentation or something like this, we had this seven minutes run all the time. And uh, it's quite a shame. Uh, so just by doing this, we allowed it to reuse the previous outputs. And so we saved a lot of time there with a few lines. Nice. 
Uh, and then, um, yeah, the next slide, too, we have, like, uh, another fun, exciting cash miss. Do we want to get into this one, Riz, or, or did you want to say something? No, I was good. Yeah, let's finish this topic, and we can jump into Q&A. Yeah, I think this was one of the most interesting uh, cash misses that uh, Martin solved. And we're looking at here, there's a task, and it has these URL inputs, which are different, right? We see the green and the blue dots. And yeah, Martin, why don't you take it from here? Yeah, I, w I wanted to get this one <laughs> in, in the show. Um, so we see something about URLs and URLs, we use them all the time. Uh, we love URLs. This one is for Docker to load some external documentation from the GDK. Why not? And it was really hard to track down because depending how or when you run the build, you would end up with... Uh, different values uh, inside the serialized version of this URL. And it turns out this is because when you serialize java.net.url, what the GDK is actually doing is it's using the value of hash code. So if you never called hash code on your object, it's going to serialize minus one. So this was like, why did, why do they do this? I didn't get one. And the, Actual underlying reason is that uh, equals an hash code for java.net.url depends on the actual resolved IP of your URL. So they called uh, DNS resolution every time you basically uh, call equals on your URL. I don't know why. You do network IO all the time. And uh, there's a 20 years old bug in, the, in OpenGDK about this. And well, right now this ship has sailed, so it's too late. They're never going to fix it because it would change a lot of stuff in a lot of GDKs all over the world. But uh, my advice is uh, don't use java.net.url. It's, it's not good at all. And um, so someone actually made a fix. It's uh, Adam from uh, working on Docker 2. So uh, they made a fix uh, to use java.net.uri instead, and uh, it's working nice since then. Awesome. Let's take some, uh, we got 12 minutes left. Uh, we were going to talk about some Kotlin DSL stuff, but we're probably not going to make it uh, to that, Martin. We might have to revisit that in a, in a future one. Let's start with uh, some of the questions here. Um, what did we... Yeah. Um, so we've got one. Uh, did you achieve the majority of the significant build time decrease? by introducing the remote build cache or solely from changing grid scripts and plugins? That, so the remote build cache was the main driver, I think, but we also had a few others, uh, like stuff that was not executed lazily. So this is the second thing. I think this, these are the two main things. I can't remember anything else. Nelson, do you remember anything else? Yeah, I, I think it's kind of hard to, um, how do you say, divide or correlate speed changes to just the introduction of the remote build cache or just changing the build scripts because they kind of both work together. For example, that um, last miss we showed, which is about the java.net.url, right? That increases your usage of the remote build cache when you solve it, but it's also a change to the build scripts, right? And, and it also helps you reuse the local build cache, you know, depending on whether hash code was called or not. Um, the other fix that we mentioned earlier, which is the fix to add the relative path inputs that only improves the usage of the remote build cache, but solely by introducing the remote build cache, you're not going to be aware of these cache misses, which is why you need the build validation scripts and the velocity to really understand and improve your build. So it's a really good question. I think, I hope that that answers that. I think so. Um, so another one is uh, maybe a silly question, not a silly question, uh, but if you have a multi-module build, let's say five modules, and one of the modules fails, can you still have the succeeding ones contribute to the build cache, or is it all or nothing? That's a good question. Um, actually, once each task executes and is successful, it will store itself in the local cache and the remote build cache if it's configured to do so. Um, so it doesn't matter. It's just if the task completes during the course of the build, it can upload uh, to the build cache. So it's not even modules, it's per task, right? 
Exactly. Yeah. What else do we got in there that we haven't answered, Tyler? Uh, what is uh, is a configuration question? What is uh, your Gradle configuration time on your builds? Um, it's not too bad. I was going to say something around 30 or 40 seconds, something like this. And yeah, we didn't touch that yet, but uh, we haven't enabled the um, configuration cache yet because uh, it's not too bad. Actually, it depends the build. Like the main build uh, is 10 or 15 seconds, I think, and the composite one can be a bit longer because it has to build other stuff. Uh, but it was acceptable for now, and we have uh, all this stuff using Docker. Like we publish to a local Maven repo in order to run all the tests. And when we call publication, we run all the key doc and we call Doka. And Doka is not 100% configuration cache compatible yet. So this is the main reason why we haven't enabled the configuration cache yet. But we will most likely uh, enable it soon. I've seen also that um, Kotlin 1.9.20 is also adding a lot of fixes for configuration cache and Kotlin native. So yeah, definitely something we want to do sooner than later. Yeah, well, one thing I was going to add to that is you can actually just check right now what the average configuration time is for local builds, for example, on the Apollo Develocity instance. Let's pull it up. I was going to just say, let's do a quick live demo and answer that with uh, with the product. Right? Who, who's going to do it? I Martin, you're going to have to do it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Gee, I love live. I love live demos, especially when I don't have to do them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you can yeah go to trends in the top and then, um, yeah, hit yes, trends sir. and then tags add local. Uh, so we see the local time. I guess you have no. Oh yeah, you have no. Oh local yeah, yeah. Builds in the last twenty eight days. Are you guys working? <laughs> <laughs> I think we we don't have the, um, the the credential set up locally, so this is why they're, they're not updated. No, uh, yeah. Well, if you go further back, if you go to the last ninety days, there's some builds there uh, for local. And then, yeah, in the build time, you see the non-execution time is fourteen seconds. Uh, so that's yeah that that is your your average. Um, and, and you can click on it. Time. Yeah, click on yeah. that non-execution time. Yep. And you can also hover over the question mark to see what that is. So it's, yeah, the lapse time for the very start of the build to the start of the first Gradle task producing outputs, which is basically your configuration time. We can also see it for individual builds, right? If I click one build. Yeah, that's a good point. If you go to the performance tab at the top, you can do the exact same thing for individual yeah, builds. Yeah, identify the long ones. Click on build time at the top and then click on non-execution time. And this is a great way of finding build outliers, right? Sometimes you have just this one build or this one developer whose non-execution time or even execution time is way longer than anyone else's. And you can just really easily jump into that in bar form. Actually, if you... if you Yeah, let's open that build scan. Yeah, if you go... Actually, if you scroll to the left a little bit, there's a really long one. To the left. Yeah. So, yeah, in the UI, there's kind of this box, uh, or or you just click the arrow, the left or right arrow. So what you do? The middle right. Martin, the grab screen. grab this guy and pull it to the left. No, this, that's not working. Oh, no. What, what what did I do? <laughs> no, yeah, there you go. Uh, this one. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. And well, uh, you only go need to hit more. it once. So hit right. Yeah, you can also drag and one. drop it, but yeah, it's yeah. this guy right here. Yeah, so that person has a nine-minute non-execution time. So what what happened in that build, right? Let's let's go investigate it. Uh, and if we go to the performance tab on the left, uh, we can see that yeah, this build spent oh, a really long time in the configuration phase. Yeah, oh, nine minutes. It, it, go go back to that. Sorry. <laughs> How do we, and Nelson, one thing you showed me once is you can look at heap and garbage collection to see if that is having an impact on yeah. that. Is that correct? 
Yeah, absolutely. And in this build, we see that it's not having an impact, which is also great to confirm, right? We see that uh, less than half know? a second. So here we see that less than half a second is being added to the total build time from garbage collection, right? And this is often something that's nearly impossible to troubleshoot if you don't have this statistic here. Um, but yeah, so maybe, yeah, to go back to the answer, a question, why, why did this build spend so much time um, in the configuration phase? There's a couple places to check. There's the configuration tab. And if you go to the configuration tab, you see that it's spending a lot of time building included plugins and also model configuration. Now, this is kind of a, a proxy for something else that's happening, um, which I already took a look at this build scan and, and, <laughs> and looked at it. So if you go to the network activity tab, you'll, you'll find out the answer here. And here we see that Ooh, the wall nice. clock. So the serial time spent downloading dependencies is nine minutes, but the wall clock time, this is actually a very new feature of Gradle Enterprise just introduced in the last version. You can actually see the wall clock time spent on downloads, which is five minutes. That means your build is five minutes longer because it, yeah, was downloading uh, dependencies. And um, yeah, so, you know, sometimes that makes sense, right? Every once in a while, you do need to download dependencies for your build. And then you can also scroll to the right on, I know it's not so visible, but yeah, scroll to the right on your screen and you can see the download speeds of all these dependencies. Maybe you don't it's have all, it. It's how, how do we do this? It should be all the way to the right, no? Yeah, yeah, just this is cut off. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Here it is. Yay. Yeah. So sometimes this happens because your network speeds are really slow. Um, in this case, that doesn't seem to be the case. Like, for example, we see that some of these artifacts are being downloaded at 1.6 megabytes a second. Um, and of course, they're all kind of happening at the same time. So maybe it's just there's really a lot of downloads that needed to happen. But yeah, that's, that's kind of. Uh, yeah, kind of a quick investigation into this one build. Um, I know we're kind of running out of time, so maybe, uh, maybe we'll take another question or or continue. And on if you uh, and Martin, if you click on projects for folks that are new to build scans and want to investigate this stuff, they could see the number of modules. So that's the. Oh yes, nice. So we do have more than modules than what I said. Yeah. Uh, all right, we got a couple of minutes left. Let's see what, what else haven't we answered. Uh, yeah, we've got a question here. Uh, if I have a Gradle plugin doing compilations, doing a compilation step invoking native binaries, let's say the protobuf compiler, are outputs of a task like that shareable between platforms? Uh, let's say we build on uh, on both Windows and maybe Mac or something. Yeah, using the uh, remote cache. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. And uh, so the, the general answer is if there are inputs that rely on platform dependent binaries, for example, this one, then they won't be shared. Now, um, speaking of protobuf, we have uh, worked on that on the solutions team and made, um, th there was one specific task that had a platform dependent output. And so we worked on making that not platform independent. So if you're using the latest version of the Protobuf Gradle plugin, uh, you won't have that issue. Um, and if you still are, um, it depends, right? Like, so in some cases, right, that pl uh, platform dependence is a requirement, uh, right? Uh, depending on what you're doing in general, right? Yeah. Um, if you're producing an artifact for Windows, right, you can't reuse that on a Mac machine. It'll fail at execution time. So um, in general, it depends. But yeah, for the protobuf plugin, it should be platform independent because those protobuf files are platform independent. Awesome. And then uh, I think lastly, just uh, someone was wondering if we will be sharing the slides. We we will absolutely share the slides. Uh, we'll do uh, a tweet and whatnot or whatever about it as well. We'll send it to... Uh, everyone who signed up um and th there'll be a youtube video for all this as well and we can let's remember to link to the slides from that and um i want to thank everyone we have a couple of slides at the end to kind of wrap up with we'll all send you the blog post that martin wrote 
for folks who want to sign up and learn more about Dell Productivity Engineer, we have a Dell Productivity Engineering newsletter has like 200,000 subscribers or something. Um, and it goes out every month. Um, in, in the next slide for folks that want to try out some of this stuff, but you know, you're not sure if you can purchase licenses for Dev Velocity Grade or Enterprise, it you can run a free build scan. A lot of what we showed today, you can run a free build scan, see what's going on in your build. Uh, what we showed today, a good portion of that is available. It's a free service. Um, you can get more information from us about it. Um, and finally, what else do we have in here? We have a developer productivity engineering handbook. If you want to really dive deep into developer productivity engineering, it's a free, uh, ebook, uh, that, uh, the great old, uh, team has, has written. And I just want to thank everyone for joining, um, for this, uh, DP lowdown and Martin, thank you for coming in and sharing and helping, uh, get the, community excited about cool things they could do in their build and the impact of developer productivity from just finding stuff in the building, getting the insights to that. Really appreciate you uh, coming in. And I know it's late in, in, in France. Uh, and want to thank uh, Nelson and Tyler for doing a great job with supporting Martin in the community and uh, helping him with his projects and coming in and sharing as well. I'll let you all go uh, since it's late in your your day in Europe. Uh, once again, thank you, audience. Uh, get, stay tuned for the video. Feel free to share it with your folks. Subscribe to the newsletter. And you can always go to this great old community Slack uh, and, to, and reach out to us and chat with us. Many of the great old folks always hang out there. And that's all we have for you. Mm -hmm.